Hello everyone. So today we are going to talk about the ureters. The ureters are muscular tubes whose peristaltic movements convey the urine from the kidneys to the urinary bladder. They are about 25 to 30 centimeters in length. They are thick walled and about 3 millimeters in diameter. So they are quite narrow. They are continuous superiorly with the renal pelvis. The ureter can be divided into two parts, the abdominal part and the pelvic part. The abdominal part extends from the ureteropelvic pelvic junction to the brim of the pelvis where it crosses the common iliac or the beginning of the external iliac artery. It descends retroperitoneally. That means it will descend behind the peritoneum. It lies on the medial side of the psoas major muscle which separates it from the transverse processes of the lumbar vertebrae. Now in this diagram, I have not shown the psoas major muscle for the simplicity's sake, but the muscle will be present in this direction on both the sides and they will, the muscle will separate the ureter from the transverse processes of the lumbar vertebrae. The abdominal part of the ureter crosses, the, crosses anterior to the genitofemoral nerve and is crossed in front by the gonadal vessels. The right ureter is covered by the second part of the duodenum in its initial part. So if we take this diagram, we can see that the abdominal portion of the right ureter is covered by the second part of the duodenum in the initial portion. It is also crossed entirely by the gonadal vessels which are direct branches of the abdominal aorta. The ureter on the right side descends lateral to the inferior vena cava and is crossed entirely by the right colic vessels and the iliocolic vessels. It also passes behind the lower part of the mesentery and the terminal ileum. The left ureter, which can be seen over here in this simplified diagram, is crossed by the left colic vessels and also it passes posterior to the sigmoid colon. At the apex of the mesocolon is the intersegmoid fossa which serves as a valuable landmark to identify the left ureter. Again the left gonadal vessels will cross the left ureter anteriorly along with the sigmoid vessels. The pelvic part the pelvic part of the ureter is roughly the same length as that of the abdominal part. It this posterior laterally on the lateral wall of the lesser pelvis along the anterior border of the greater sciatic notch. This is the greater sciatic notch. And opposite to the ischial spine, it turns anteromedially. Opposite to the ischial spine, which is this structure, it will turn anteromedially and open into the base of the urinary bladder. The On the pelvic wall, it is anterior to the internal iliac artery. So this is the common iliac artery. This is the common iliac artery. This is the internal iliac and this is the external iliac artery. So, so this is internal iliac and this And this one is external iliac. Sorry about this. I need really need to get the Apple Pencil once the shops are open. I plan to get one. Then things will be much easier. Till then, please bear with me. So, this is the internal iliac and this is the external iliac artery. It also lies anterior to the sacroiliac joint. It also lies anterior to the sacroiliac joint. It progressively crosses and is medial to the umbilical artery, which we can see over here. It progressively, pro, it progressively crosses and is medial to the umbilical artery. This is the umbilical artery. This is the ureter. And also the obturator vessels, that is the obturator artery. Okay. So the ureter will lie medial to the umbilical artery 
in the obturator artery. In the males, the ureter will be crossed from the lateral to the medial side by the pass difference. So if this is a diagram of a male individual, so the pass difference will cross the ureter from the lateral to the medial side. In the females, it lies behind the ovary. So this is a diagram of a female pelvis. It lies behind the ovaries, forming the posterior boundary of the ovarian fossa. It forms the posterior boundary of the ovarian fossa. It is located inferior to the broad ligament. So this is the broad ligament. This is the broad ligament. So it is present inferior to the broad ligament and uterine artery. So this is the uterine artery. So this happens near the cervix of the uterus. So this is the uterus. Okay, this is the uterus. This is the urinary bladder. So this muscular tube will be the vagina. So near the cervix, so somewhere here is the cervix, which will protrude a little bit inside the vaginal cavity. So near the cervix of the uterus, the ureter is inferior to the broad ligament and the uterine artery. The uterine artery is superior, anterior superior to the ureter. Okay, so this happens near the uterine cervix. Now let us talk about the opening of the ureter. The ureter opens into the base of the urinary bladder. The ureter opens into the base of the urinary bladder. Here I have shown only one opening. So there will be another opening that will be coming into the urinary bladder like this. So the distance between these two openings, so the distance between these two openings one over here and the other over here is about 5 centimeters in a distended bladder but the distance is somewhat less when the bladder is not distended. Now let us talk about the arterial supply. So this is a very simplified diagram. I have drawn this diagram from Gray's Anatomy. So the there are a few important aspects regarding the blood supply of the ureter. The first thing that immediately strikes is that the ureter is richly supplied with arterial system. It receives branches coming from multiple major branches around it. The arteries that supply the ureter divide into an ascending and a descending branch and these ascending and descending branch of these ureteric arteries will have strong anastomosis on the wall of the ureter. The other important feature is that the branches that supply the ureter in the proximal portion they all arise from the medial side as we can see over here. All the branches that supply the proximal part of the ureter they are coming from the medial side. This is the medial side. This is the lateral side. So all the branches that will be supplying the proximal part or the abdominal part of the ureter will be arising or supplying the ureter from the medial side. There is nothing on the lateral side. There are no branches arising from the lateral side. But the picture changes immediately once the ureter goes into the pelvic cavity. So the distal portion of the ureter is getting all the branches from the lateral side. There is nothing coming from the medial side. So the ureter will be supplied by branches on the medial side in the proximal portion and it will be supplied by branches from the lateral side in the distal portion. The arteries that give branches to the ureter are renal artery, gonadal artery, there is a direct branch coming from the abdominal aorta, there is a branch coming from the common iliac artery, there is a branch coming from the internal iliac artery, then there is the superior vesicle artery, the uterine artery, middle rectal artery, and the inferior vesicle artery. The upper part of the ureter is mainly supplied by the branches coming from the renal artery. The middle portion of the ureter is supplied by the branches coming from the gonadal artery, the abdominal aorta and the branch from the common iliac artery. The lowermost part or the lower portion of the distal portion of the ureter is supplied by the branches coming from the internal iliac, the superior vesicle, uterine, 
middle rectal artery and the inferior vesical artery. Now let us talk about the lymphatic drainage. As we saw in case of the arterial supply where the upper part was supplied by the branches coming from the renal, then the middle portion was supplied by the branches coming from the gonadal, abdominal aorta, common iliac and the inferior portion being supplied by the branches coming from the internal iliac, the superior inferior vesicle, the middle rectal and the uterine artery. The same pattern is also followed by the lymphatic drainage. The upper part of the ureter is drained to the lateral aortic lymph nodes which are these ones. So the upper part of the ureter will be drained by the lateral aortic nodes which are these ones. The middle part of the ureter will be drained by the common iliac nodes, the nodes that are associated with the common iliac artery. And the inferior portion will be drained by the external iliac and the internal iliac nodes which will be associated with the external iliac and the internal iliac arteries. So again recapitulating, the upper part of the ureter will be drained by the aortic node, lateral aortic node. Then the middle portion will be drained by the common iliac nodes. The inferior part will be drained by the nodes associated with the external and internal iliac arteries, that is the external and internal iliac nodes. Now let us talk about the nerve supply. The Ureteric innervation is very rich. It receives the innervations from the aortic plexus, the superior hypogastric plexus, and the inferior hypogastric plexus, and the renal plexus. The visceral efferents, that is the nerves carrying information towards the organ, have both sympathetic and parasympathetic components. So the sympathetic will be derived from the thoracic 10 to lumbar 1 segments and the parasympathetic ones will be derived from the sacral 2nd to sacral 4th segment of the spinal cord. The visceral afferents will go to the thoracic 11 to the lumbar 2 segments. Now let us talk about the clinical anatomy. So this is a simplified diagram. So excessive ureteric distension or spasm of its muscle provokes a very severe pain called the ureteric colic. So ureteric colic is the pain. The pain is spasmodic and agonizing and is referred to the cutaneous areas innervated from the spinal segment which supply the ureter that is T11 to L2. It shoots down and forward from the loin to the groin and sometimes to the scrotum or the labium majus and may even extend into the proximal anterior aspect of the thigh. It will depend which part of the ureter is involved. If it is the upper part of the ureter then usually the pain shoots down from loin to groin. If it is in the lower middle part of the ureter it usually involves the scrotum and the labium majus in case of female and if it is in the very lower distal part of the ureter then the pain may even get radiated towards the proximal anterior aspect of the thigh. The ureter is a very narrow organ. It is about 3 millimeters in diameter. But there are areas within the ureter in its course that are even narrower than the 3 millimeter diameter. So these are the pelvic ureteric junction. This is the portion where the renal pelvis ends and the ureter begins. So the dilated portion will taper down and just before it continues as the ureter, it has got a very narrow segment. So this segment, the pelvic ureteric junction, is narrower than the rest of the ureteric diameter. The seg second such narrowing is seen near the pelvic brim, where it is crossed by the common iliac artery. The third of such narrowing is seen in the ureterovesical junction, the portion th through which the ureter enters the base of the bladder. In fact, this is the ureter. This is the narrowest portion of the entire length of the ureter. Sometimes a stone in the kidney, which is called the renal calculus, may slip down through this ureter. At this point, it will be called an ureteric calculus. So please do not make the mistake 
of confusing between colic and calculus. Urotary colic is the pain and calculus is the stone. So a urotary calculus will cause urotary colic. They are not the same. Okay. So a calculus will cause a colic. Colic means spasmodic agonizing pain that will come in, stay for a while, then it will go off, then again come back later on. So this 3 millimeter narrow diameter of the ureter when it gets a renal stone from above it tries to get rid of it by its strong peristaltic movements. The distension of the ureter will send painful stimulus through the uh, spinal segments T11 to L2 and as a result it will the patient will start feeling severe agonizing pain which may radiate areas innervated by the T11 to L2 segments. So this is the referred pain. These junctions or constrictions are important because when the stone rolls down it may get impacted in any of these three junctions. The stone may get in fact impacted in the pelvic ureteric junction or in the pelvic brim, near the pelvic brim or in the ureteral vesicle junction. In any case if the stone is impacted the portion of the ureter proximal to it gets dilated and that can be seen clearly with the help of an ultrasonography. To identify the stones clinicians generally order a special kind of x-ray called the IVP or intravenous pilogram. In this x-ray the picture is similar to this picture that I have shown in the earlier part. The entire ureteric tree is or the collecting system of the kidney is properly demarcated by a radio opaque dye. So whenever a stone is suspected then the stone will be present near the transverse processes of the lumbar vertebrae if it is in the abdominal part. So an IVP is a very important tool in case of identifying a renal stone. It is also used to see the functionality of a kidney. So this is all about the ureteric anatomy. We will talk, we will have a video on the histology of ureter and then we will also have a video on the developmental part of the ureter. The ureter is very important for undergraduate students because this may come as a long question in their final exams wherein they might be asked to write about or to discuss about the anatomy of ureter under certain headings headings like arterial supply development microanatomy gross anatomy its relations there are multiple options so my suggestion to all the students is that they should prepare the ureter thoroughly so that they can attempt any question from the topic so Thank you for your patient listening and we will see you in a different video.